Hello everyone, how are you all doing? Well guys, this is Sagar Dalvi and I welcome you to the batch of excellence where we all are aware that we have been learning organic chemistry since a long time and we have been studying this organic chemistry not just with respect to our boards but we are making sure all the concepts required for JE and NEET have also been covered here. So guys, I welcome you to a brand new chapter today and today we are going to learn a chapter called Polymers. Well guys, we know that we are almost at the end of organic chemistry course and two small chapters left, polymer and chemistry in everyday life. So today, we'll be discussing about polymers where we'll be dividing this chapter into two small sessions. <coughs> so in the first part of our session, we'll include classification, introduction of polymer and some addition polymers. And then the second part, that is second session, we'll be talking about condensation polymers. So to be precise, let me just first show you what exactly are we going to learn in our today's class. Well, everyone, on your screen, you can see we'll be first getting introduced to what exactly are polymers and how do we define polymers. Related to term polymers, we'll also be talking about what is called as monomer. Once that is done, we'll be talking about various ways by which we classify the polymers. And then we'll be talking about some addition polymers, like I said in the beginning. So what all addition polymers will be learning? We'll be talking about LDPE, that is low density polyethylene. Sometimes it is also abbreviated as just LDP, low density polyethylene. Similarly, we'll be talking about high density polyethylene, HDPE. We'll then discuss about Teflon, that is basically polytetrafluoroethylene, followed by polyacrylonitrile, that is PAN, sometimes also called as Orlon. We'll be also discussing about polyvinyl chloride. And then finally, we'll be talking one very important, that is important addition polymer, which is natural rubber. And we'll also discussing few examples of synthetic rubber as well. So guys, let us first talk about the term polymer. Well, firstly, when we talk about polymers, why we have to learn this chapter? Because in our daily life, if you see so many things we come across are basically nothing but polymeric thing only. So even if you talk about a simple things, um, a polyethylene bag that we use to carry maybe vegetables or some regular stuff. So that polyethylene bag is what? It is a polymer. Or the paints that we see on our walls is again nothing but a polymers. The toys are made up of plastics. What is it? It is again a polymer. That clearly indicates there are so many things in our daily life without which probably our life will become difficult are eventually nothing but the polymers. And hence, guys, we need to understand how exactly these polymers are made. So let us talk about what polymers and how exactly do we define it. So we say polymer is nothing but a giant macromolecule of high molecular mass. Polymer is a giant macromolecule of a high molecular mass made up of many small unit of low molecular mass, which we call it as monomer. And the process of conversion of these monomers into a polymer is what we call it as polymerization. So guys, so we saw three terms here. We studied what is polymer, we learned what is monomer and what is the process called as polymerization. I repeat again, a giant macromolecule of high molecular mass is what we call it as polymer. It is made up of many small units of low molecular mass called as monomer and the process of conversion of these monomers into polymer is what we call it as polymerization. So generally you will see that these monomers will combine with each other through covalent bond and forming that high molecular mass compound which we refer it as polymers. Guys, let us see how exactly do we classify this. There are several ways by which we can classify polymers. <laughs> on your screen, the first way of classification is on the basis of sources. So let's say if any polymer such as cellulose or if you talk about starch or proteins, these all are the polymers which we get it from the natural resources. All those polymers which are obtained from plant or animals, meaning natural resources, we call them as natural polymers. 
the second type of this polymer is, uh, this type of classification is synthetic polymers as the name suggests if any polymer is prepared in the laboratory or any man made polymer is what we call it as a synthetic polymer so just to give you an example nylon or terylene all these are the polymers which we prepare in the laboratory so such polymer which are prepared in the laboratory or which are artificially made is what you call it as synthetic polymer but then there exists third category which is basically a combination of this two we call it as semi synthetic polymers now what are these semi synthetic polymers just to give you an example so rayon uh, cellulose acetate this polymer basically you originally you take it from a uh, natural polymer such as cellulose but to improve some of its properties such as mechanical strength or anything related to that kind of property in order to improvise on those properties we perform some chemical reactions on that so that it's some physical properties have been improvised so such polymer which is originally obtained from a natural resources but we have performed some chemical reactions on that so this is kind of a hybrid of natural as well as synthetic so we refer this kind of polymers as semi synthetic polymers so guys based on the resources or the sources from where that particular polymer is obtained we classify them into three natural synthetic and semi synthetic polymers so second simple classification is on the basis of structure i want everyone to pay attention here well so far what we have understood from the term polymer it's a it's a macromolecule obtained by combining of many monomeric unit isn't it so imagine if those many monomeric units are connected to each other to form a straight chain or straight polymeric chain like this imagine if there are many monomeric unit combining with each other to form a long straight linear chain like this then those polymer will be referred as linear polymeric chain or you can call them as linear polymer now this linear polymers imagine if this linear polymer does not carry any branches so such several linear polymeric chain can stack over each other like you can see here because we are able to stack this linear polymeric chain without branches over each other they give very closely packed structure and because of this close packing of many linear polymeric chain they are generally found to be having a very high density and also very high melting point so in the later part of this chapter when we are going to learn about low density polyethylene and high density polyethylene we are going to refer this once again so polyethylene or rather you will say high density polyethylene is one of the example of linear polymeric chain whereas second type of polymer under this category we call it as a branched polymer as the name suggest if we have a linear polymeric chain containing one or more branches attached to that linear polymeric chain then you call it as a branched polymeric chain for example structurally suppose if i say this is the linear polymeric chain as we have represented earlier but if you find there are one or more branches like this present in the polymeric chain then we call it as a branched polymer now if you observe here because we have got one or more branches attached to the linear polymeric chain we cannot stack many such branch polymeric chain over each other in a closely packed structure so because they cannot have a closely packed structure just like this linear polymeric chain can have you will find that the melting point even the densities of such polymer is generally lower so that is the difference between the linear polymer and branched polymer linear polymeric chain are long continuous chain of monomeric unit because they are continuous long or straight chain of polymeric units they can be stacked over each other and is their density is higher 
in case of branch chain polymer you will find these are the linear polymers containing one or more branches because of those branches they belong to category of branch chain polymer and such branch chain polymer cannot stack over each other so they cannot have close packing of polymeric chains so the third type which comes from the same type of classification that is based on structure we call it as cross-linked or network polymer well just to give an example of this bakelite is one of the very common example which belongs to the category of a cross-linked polymer now what exactly this cross-linked polymer is imagine if we have got two or more such linear polymeric chain so this are the linear polymeric chain and such linear polymeric chains are further held together by some of the cross linkages so presence of this cross linkages provides a mechanical strength to this polymeric chains such polymeric chains which are held together by some of the cross linkages then the overall polymer will be referred to category called as cross link or network polymer and bakelite is one of such examples so dear students based on the structure we classify polymers into three categories linear polymer which is basically a continuous long chain of monomeric unit branched polymer which is basically a linear polymeric chain containing one or more branches and the third is a cross link or network polymer where two or more polymeric chains are held by some cross linkages in between which provides extra mechanical strength to this polymer third classification which is the important one that is classification on the basis of molecular forces okay guys so we saw here there are several polymeric chains which are present together in a polymer now based on what is the intermolecular force that is holding those polymeric chains together we have got further four types so the first one is called as elastomers well i'm sure everyone have come across this polymer in the daily life elastomer uh, simple elastic we call it as so elastomers are those kind of polymers where you will find it has got a very high elasticity so when i say very high elasticity meaning by applying the force on it we can stretch that polymers about 10 time of its original length but the moment the moment you relieve that force which we have applied it come back and regain its original shape that is what you call it as elastic which is nothing but a type of polymer called as elastomers now why are we able to stretch that polymer about 10 times of its original length it's because the intermolecular force which holds the two or more polymeric chains together is generally a very weak intermolecular force of attraction such as van der waals force of attraction because of that weak van der waals force of attraction we can stretch the polymer about 10 times of its original length but the moment you relieve that force it comes back and regains its original shape because that force is a weak van der waals forces so that was about the elastomer the second type fibers fibers are those polymers where the several polymeric chains are now held by relatively stronger intermolecular force of attraction such as hydrogen bond or sometime even dipole dipole interaction now because the various polymeric chains are held together by stronger intermolecular force of attraction its elasticity is relatively lesser as compared to the elasticity found in the polymer such as elastomers so you can say elastomers are the ones where polymeric chains are held by weaker intermolecular forces such as van der waal whereas fibers are those polymers where the polymeric chains are held together by relatively stronger force of attraction such as hydrogen bond or you can say even dipole dipole interaction the third type of polymers which we call it as thermoplastic polymers well guys <clears throat> example for elastomer like we said the simple rubber 
the natural or the synthetic rubber belongs to category of elastomer if you talk about fibers nylon is the common example where you'll see the polymeric chains are held tightly by hydrogen bonding so nylon could be example of fiber now thermoplastic well there are so many things that we come across in our daily life like most of the toys are made up of plastic right even buckets are made up of plastic guys imagine when you heat those kind of plastic or those kind of polymer upon heating they melts and if you allow that molten form of plastic to cool down for a while you'll find that it becomes again a rigid solid further if you heat it again if you reheat it it will be further converted into its molten state and if you cool it down once again it will be converted to a rigid solid so heating to melt it and cooling down to make it again a rigid solid can be done as many times as we want in case of polymer such as thermoplastic polymer and this possibility of able to heat it to melt and cool it down to make it rigid again is possible because the intermolecular force of attraction present among the polymeric chain in case of this polymer are that of intermediary of that of elastomers and fibers so in case of elastomer the the intermolecular forces were weak van der waals and in case of fibers it was the stronger intermolecular forces such as hydrogen bond so the intermediary forces of these two types of forces are the ones which holds the polymeric chains together in case of thermoplastic polymer because of which we can heat and melt it and cool it down to make it rigid solid as many times as we want Finally, the fourth one, thermosetting polymer. Remember, the example for network or the cross-link polymer which we consider bakelite is the same example which is also applicable for thermosetting. Now, what thermosetting polymer means? <coughs> Look at the term thermosetting. Ideally, if you talk about thermosetting polymer, these are like semi-fluid kind of polymers, which when you heat it in a mold or once you heat it. they become infusible rigid solid mass infusible rigid solid mass which means once you heat them up the polymeric chain develops some of the cross linkages because of which it becomes infusible solid rigid mass such that upon reheating they cannot be converted back into its molten stage so once you heat them up they permanently sets into a rigid solid because the permanently sets into rigid solid dear students we call it as thermosetting polymer and the ability of this thermosetting polymer to permanently sets into infusible solid mass is because of development of the cross linkages among the polymeric chains so if you see this four polymers the basic difference lies in what are the forces that are holding the polymeric chains together in case of elastomer it is the weaker van der waal forces in case of fibers we have got strong hydrogen bonding or even dipole dipole interaction in case of thermoplastic polymer the intermolecular forces are intermediary of that of weak van der waal and stronger hydrogen bond and in case of thermosetting it's a semi fluid kind of substance which upon heating develop cross linkages that holds the polymeric chains together so these are three important classification of polymers first on the basis of sources from where we actually get the polymer second on the basis of structure how the polymeric chains looks all together and the third one on the basis of intermolecular forces other than this we also classify polymers on the basis of mode of preparation based on how particular polymer is prepared we classify polymers into two types addition polymers and condensation polymers so as the name suggests if any particular polymer is obtained by an addition reaction we will call it as addition polymer sometime this polymers are also known as <coughs> chain growth polymerization or addition polymerization like we said so just to give you an example guys we have come across many uh, routine polymers like polyethylene so polyethylene is obtained by the process of 
addition polymerization of ethylene molecules so we call it as addition polymer there are some type of polymers which are obtained by the process of condensation such as nylon is obtained by condensation polymer terylene is obtained by the process of condensation polymer so those belongs to category of condensation sometimes we also refer it as step growth polymerization that's the old name of the process of polymerization nowadays we call it as condensation polymer so simply if any polymer is prepared by the process of addition reaction we call it as addition polymers and if any polymer is obtained by the process of condensation we call it as condensation polymers all right guys while other than this there are some more ways by which you can classify like based on the type of monomeric unit present we also classify polymer into two types homopolymer and copolymer so as the name suggests homopolymer as in if any particular polymer is made up of only one type of monomeric unit i'll call it as homopolymer like the example which we saw just now polyethylene it is only made up of ethylene monomeric unit or pvc polyvinyl chloride you see the name even pvc indicates it is made up of only vinyl chloride as a monomeric unit so it belongs to category of homopolymer likewise if i talk about polystyrene so polystyrene is made up of only styrene as a monomeric unit that is phenylethene so you call it as the homopolymer whereas the second type based on the monomeric unit use we call it as copolymer so if any polymer is made up of more than one type of monomeric unit we call it as copolymer for example let's say if i talk about sbr styrene butadiene rubber it is a synthetic rubber obtained by addition reaction of styrene and butadiene so this polymer has more than one type of monomer so we call it as copolymer another example could be nbr acrylonitrile butadiene rubber another example could be nylon 66 which is also made up of two different types of monomeric units so that is another classification homopolymer and copolymer on the basis of the type of monomeric units used and then again you can also classify polymer into biodegradable and non biodegradable polymers so we know that there are several polymer responsible for the pollution so those polymers create pollution because they cannot be decomposed so those polymer that cannot be decomposed we call them as non biodegradable whereas there exist some polymers such as nylon 2 nylon 6 or phbv or polyglycolic and polylactic acid these all polymers can be decomposed hence we call them as biodegradable so that is another classification biodegradable and non biodegradable but guys the importance ones which we have included so far in our classification number 1 on the basis of sources number 2 on the basis of structure of polymeric unit number 3 on the basis of intermolecular forces that holds the polymer together number 4 is uh the previous one was number 3 number 4 on the basis of mode of polymerization or the method of polymerization all right everyone so guys what we have learned so far we first got introduced to how important polymers are in our daily life then we saw how do we exactly define polymer monomer and process called polymerization then we straight away saw a various way of classifying the polymers guys remember you might find a same example belonging to the different types of classification because classification is on the basis of what exactly is the property that is going to put that polymer into particular category so it might happen same polymer might belong to the different classification for example if i talk about bakelite bakelite belongs to category of cross link polymer which is based on the structure bakelite also belongs to polymer of thermosetting polymer which is based on the intermolecular forces so same example might belong to different types of classification guys out of so many today we are going to discuss some polymer which belongs to the first type of polymerization that is addition polymerization again addition polymerization reaction can be initiated by free radical 
or by cation or by anion. So, addition polymerization based on what is the species that is initiating the reaction can be classified into three categories. Free radical addition polymerization, cationic addition polymerization and anionic addition polymerization. However, as far as our syllabus is concerned, we need to understand the basic mechanism of free radical addition polymerization. So, guys, introducing you all the free radical addition polymerization mechanism. We also call it as chain growth polymerization. Here we go. <clears throat> so, free radical addition mechanism takes place in three steps. Step one. Step of initiation. Look here. To understand step of initiation, let's say we have got benzoyl peroxide C six H five. C double bond O O O C double bond O and C six H five. As we all have studied in organic chemistry that peroxides are the one which are vulnerable to undergo homolytic fission. So this peroxide linkage will undergo homolytic fission. As a result of homolytic fission, you will find this O will carry an odd electron, even this O will carry an odd electron. So, we will be getting two radical, which can be written as 2C6H5, C6H5, C double bond O, O radical. Right, everyone? Now, this C6H5COO radical will further undergo homolytic fission to produce phenyl free radical. So, you can see here, we will be getting C6H5 radical. So, two equivalents of C6H5 free radical plus odd electron on oxygen and new odd electron will be getting by the homolytic fission of this carbon carbon bond. So, odd electron and carbon, odd electron and oxygen will be shared to form a double bond between carbon and oxygen and that will indicate there will be release of CO2 gas. So, a free radical polymerization reaction mechanism is initiated by taking peroxide such as benzoyl peroxide which has now generated a phenyl radical. Now, this phenyl radical is initiator. So, this phenyl radical will initiate the reaction. So, let us take that phenyl radical here. I am taking one of the phenyl radical C6 H5 odd electron which will now attack at ethene. All right. This radical, we know the fact that existing radical also has the ability to carry out homolytic fission of a pi bond. So, this odd electron will carry out homolytic fission of this carbon carbon pi bond. So, let us say odd electron on one of the carbon will be shared with odd electron of phenyl to form a new covalent bond between the phenyl group and the CH2 group, resulting in the formation of C6H5. CH2 bonded to CH2 radical. Now, the species which we have got will further attack on many such ethene because ethene is our monomeric unit. So, just like the phenyl radical formed here attacked at the first molecule of ethene to form a further free radical, likewise now this radical will be all available to attack at many more such ethene radical and reaction will go on and on and on. That step is what we call it as step of propagation. So, in step number two, which is step of
propagation we have got C6H5CH2 CH2 radical which is now set to attack at many such n number of monomeric unit which is ethylene like we said earlier a radical is capable of carrying out homolytic fission of a pi bond so it will carry out a homolytic fission of a pi bond to produce odd electron of each one of this and the radical will be again attacking at another radical and see now the polymeric chain can be represented like this C6H5 CH2 CH2 which has attacked at many such radicals so just one extra i'm representing here ch2 ch2 or like that. all right so reaction will go on and on and on to form a linear polymeric chain of ethylene units like that that's how you're calling it as many ethylene meaning polyethylene now once the linear polymeric chain is formed of a high molecular mass eventually reaction stops in step number three which you call it as step of termination so there are many termination steps whatever free radicals are present obviously randomly they can combine with each other and the further addition polymerization reaction will be terminated there so it might happen that the phenyl radical that you have got might combine with each other or maybe this phenyl ethene radical which we have got can also further combine uh, phenyl ethane free radical might combine with each other to stop the reaction or maybe this unit which you see in the form of radical can combine to stop the reaction so there are many possibilities of termination step i am representing one of those let's say in step number three step of termination Now, let's say I'm taking two of such units which are combining C6H5, CH2, CH2. CH2 and time CH2 CH2 see now two of such units are combining with each other so when this will combine we will be getting five formation of a product well formation of product I'm representing down here now since we have got two of such units C6H5 CH2 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 in times CH2 CH2 now this is second unit which I am representing here <coughs> So that is your one of the step of termination so guys like we said based on the mode of preparation there are two ways polymers can be obtained by addition polymerization and by condensation as of now we are discussing about the polymers obtained by addition polymerization so we have seen one of the method of preparation of 
addition polymer that is the addition reaction via free radical initiator so free radical initiator was phenyl free radical which attacked at ethene to produce some radical which in a step of propagation gave us a further polymerization reaction and eventually once the polymer of a desired molecular weight is obtained then the reaction stops itself by combination of several polymer of uh, several free radical which exist in the reaction mixture so that's how the mechanism of free radical polymerization exists <coughs> Now everyone what we have to learn here is several examples of addition polymerization in our today's class and in the next class will be discussing some example of condensation polymerization. So in addition polymerization the important class of polymer that we learn are polyethylene which are of two type high density polyethylene low density polyethylene we will also be talking about Teflon that is tetra polytetrafluoroethylene. We'll be then talking about PVC that is polyvinyl chloride. Likewise, we'll be talking about fifth one that is PAN polyacrylonitrile. Before which, before we understand the low density and high density polyethylene, I want you guys to observe this. If you see this polymer, if you see this polymer, you will see there are many ethylene units combining with each other to form a long linear polymeric chain you see they are forming a long linear polymeric chain now try to recall classification on the basis of structure we had a first type called as linear polymer so if <coughs> many ethylenes are combining with each other to form a long straight chain or a linear polymeric chain of such monomer then this is going to be called as linear polymer but imagine if from this any one of the carbon of linear polymeric chain, if one of the hydrogen is abstracted by some radical like this, and then that radical which is formed here at this carbon upon loss of hydrogen radical, further branch can be attached. So you might get some branches present here. Formation of such branches, one or more in the linear polymeric chain, will further result in the second type of polymer that is called as branch chain polymer and this is the basic difference that lies in high density polyethylene and low density polyethylene so to understand that let us assume let us assume in this addition polymerization if i talk about <clears throat> high density polyethylene you can call it as either HDP or you can also call it as HDPE that is absolutely fine so like we saw here there will be many such ethylene units will be connected to each other likewise let's say I am highlighting one of the H here And like we said, there will be n number of such units will be connected to each other. <clears throat> now, because there is just ethylene units connected to each other to form a linear polymeric chain, structurally, we represented earlier like this. This is one of the linear polymeric chain of ethylene monomer. Now, imagine if we take many such <clears throat> polymeric chains, those polymeric chain can be stacked over each other. Hence, because of the ability that we are able to put it or we are able to stack it over each other, they will occupy lesser volume or you can say they will give you a closely packed structure. Because of closely packed structure, their melting point and their densities are going to be very high. So, we call it as high density polyethylene. All right. Now, imagine <coughs> if we carry out a process where some external radical just like we saw phenyl was attacking at the ethylene to form a radical let's say that radical has carried out homolytic fission here because of that homolytic fission now this polymeric chain will have a radical formation like c 
CH or electron. CH2 and N. And if this further combines with an ethylene unit to form a branch here, so let's say this is further undergoing homolytic fission because the presence of external radical can carry out homolytic fission of a pi bond. So, if this pi bond is broken homolytically, odd electron at this carbon and another odd electron will be formed at other carbon. So, odd electron at one of the carbon will be shared to form a branch here. So, <coughs> we will be getting CH2, CH2. Now, this is CH forming a branch here with odd electron. So, this is the carbon which is now carrying odd electron at the free end and further CH2 present n number of times. Now, guys, have a look at this. Now, if you compare this this linear polymer and this polymer, this is no more linear because we have got one branch. If we have got one branch, then the structural representation for such polymer has to be represented somewhat like this. Now, I have shown one of the branch. It might happen in the further part of polymeric chain, you might have one more branch like that. So, if we have got branches present at the linear polymeric chain, then this will be called as branch chain polymer. If it is a branch chain polymer, obviously, we won't be able to stack it over one another just like it happens in case of a linear polymeric chain. If you are unable to stack it over one another, then the density and melting point of such polymer is going to be a lower. Hence, this representation speaks for the low density polyethylene. So, dear student, this is the basic difference lies between high density polyethylene and low density polyethylene. However, while representing them, if you observe, they have just ethylene units connected to each other, maybe in the linear form or maybe in the branch form. Hence, as far as representation of these two polymer is concerned, representation is exactly same. But now you know precisely what is the difference that lies between high density polyethylene and low density polyethylene. Now, for the sake of representation, how do we represent? Let me show you that. So, guys, we are learning some important addition polymer here. The first one we are talking about is low density polyethylene. So, low density polyethylene we represent like this. Since it is polyethylene, I am taking n number of ethylene units CH2, double bond CH2, subjecting it to the process of polymerization. And upon polymerization, this many ethylene units will be combining with each other, whose representation can be shown like this. Present n times. Whereas, if you just put some more condition, conditions here, the polymerization of many ethylene to form a low density polyethylene is carried out generally at a higher pressure of around 1000 to 2000 atmospheric pressure at 350 to 570 kelvin now the representation of HDP that is high density polythene can be shown exactly like this, but you know the difference as we saw on a previous slide. So, just to represent, we will say high density polyethylene is represented as <coughs> and now this is subjected to process of polymerization.
at relatively lower pressure and lower temperature around 330 to 333 Kelvin but the important condition is that this polymerization of preparation of high density polyethylene is carried out in presence of Ziegler Natta catalyst Ziegler Natta catalyst Ziegler Natta catalyst is basically triethyl aluminum and TiCl4 I'm sure you guys have studied this in inorganic chemistry. So, n number of ethylene molecules subjected to polymerization at relatively low pressure and at lower temperature as compared to low density polyethylene in presence of Ziegler Natta catalyst, and this will result in the formation of formation of polyethylene without any branches so it is going to be a linear polymeric chain which can be stacked over each other hence it will be high density polyethylene so guys this is the only difference that you will see in condition otherwise representation of reaction for ldp and hdp is exactly the same now just like that <coughs> if i do some changes in the monomeric unit the same changes will also appear in the final product and hence based on the changes there will be three more type of addition polymer that we learn first one is polytetrafluoroethene that is called teflon so guys imagine if we take n number of and if we subject it to process of polymerization so this is 1122 tetrafluoroethene tetra fluoro ethene which we are subjecting it to process of polymerization so the formation of polymer can be simply represented at guys just the way we saw if you see this tetrafluoroethene and the monomer of ethene, it's just that all the four H's have been substituted by fluorine. So even in the product, just this two, these four H's would be substituted by the fluorine. Hence, the product can be represented like this. N number of times. And this will be now called as Teflon or you can also call it as polytetrafluoroethene. Next one is polyacrylonitrile as the name suggests your monomeric unit is going to be acrylonitrile. See the name of polymer itself in most of the cases you will find the name of polymer itself indicating what is the monomer to be used. So, acrylonitrile is nothing but vinyl cyanide. So, let's say if we have n number of CH2 double bond, if I put it CH2, it will again become ethene. Instead of that, I am substituting 1H with the nitrile group that is cyanide. So, this becomes vinyl cyanide. We also call it as acrylonitrile. Uh, this is subjected to process of polymerization so if this is monomeric unit how are we going to represent the product just the like the just the way we do it in case of polyethylene just that one of the h will be substituted by a nitrile groups so we'll put it this way CH2 
CH and now 1H have been substituted by nitrile. This will be repeated n number of time. So, if we call this monomer as acrylonitrile, the final product obtained will be called as polyacrylonitrile can be simply abbreviated as PAN. All right, everyone. Simple. Now, see, instead of cyanide, if I just bring chlorine, so vinyl cyanide would be called as vinyl chloride, VC, vinyl chloride. So, upon polymerization, what are we going to get? Polymer of vinyl chloride, that is polyvinyl chloride. So, let's say, now monomeric unit is vinyl chloride. We are taking n number of CH2 double bond CH and Cl subjecting it to process of polymerization and the product obtained will be polyvinyl chloride so CH2 CH and Cl repeated n number of time this is this was vinyl chloride the product will be called as polyvinyl chloride We call it as PVC. All right, everyone. So, in addition, polymerization, this five example we'll have to remember LDP, low density polyethylene, high density polyethylene, just the difference in the condition. Whereas Teflon, that is polytetrafluoroethylene, and then doing by, then by changing hydrogens by the different group, you will get polyacrylonitrile and also the polyvinyl chloride in this addition polymerization we also learn one more very important type of polymer dear students that is nothing but rubber so the next type of addition polymer that we're going to learn is rubber <coughs> just give me a second everyone <clears throat> all right everyone so the next type that we are learning is rubber so again rubber could be of two types one based on of course resources one is natural rubber and other types that we are going to learn are synthetic rubber okay let us first talk about natural rubber remember the moment you talk about natural rubber the first thing that should come in your mind natural rubber is nothing but <coughs> all cis polyisoprene all cis polyisoprene now let us understand what exactly this term isoprene means look isoprene is basically 2 methyl 1 comma 3 butadiene so structurally if i represent isoprene ch2 double bond ch assume there is one h which i'm going to substitute this is 1 comma 3 butadiene and I'm substituting one of the hydrogen by a methyl group so we call it as 2 methyl 1 comma 3 butadiene this is what you call it as isoprene so isoprene is a monomeric unit which will be subjected to a process of polymerization which will result in the formation of polyisoprene 
and with respect to the position of this substituent methyl if you see that methyl are on the same side the product would be called as all cis polyisoprene and the naturally occurring rubber is found to be all cis polyisoprene guys you may have a straight question on this which of the following is natural rubber so you may have several example you may have cis polyisoprene or they might just give you polyisoprene along with buna s and buna n so remember the one which says all cis polyisoprene is going to be your natural rubber remember that now let us try and understand how exactly does this formation of polymerization looks like <coughs> look as far as the representation of this polyisoprene is concerned we can represent it this way so n number of isoprene units which is subjected to process of polymerization which undergoes 1,4 addition reaction we'll explain what is 1,4 addition once we'll see the detailed addition process and this will result in the formation of a polymer represented like this CH2 C3H3 double bond CH CH2 and this will be repeated n number of times so this is basically cis poly isoprene okay now let us understand this everyone well so we know the fact the monomeric units are isoprene this is isoprene 2 methyl 1 3 butadiene The same isoprene units, if I put it in the bond line formula, we can show it this way. One comma three butadiene, and this is the methyl substituent at carbon number two. Just to make it simpler, let's do the numbering one, two, three, four. Let's say I'm taking many of such units. I'm taking three, you'll be of course having more than three, so you can put it n number of such units, okay? Everywhere we'll do the numbering. One, two, Three, four, one, two, three, and four. Now see, <coughs> you can see there is conjugation of pi bonds over here. So as a result of conjugation, a pi bond between three and four shifts towards three and two. Then this pi bond between one and two will delocalize at carbon number one, making carbon number one electron rich carbon number four electron deficient and new pi bond between second and third now because carbon number four is becoming deficient this pi bond can attack at the fourth carbon atom here making carbon two deficient so this will shift here we will make again carbon number four deficient but you will see there will be new bond formation will be taking place between carbon number fourth of first monomeric unit and carbon number first of the second monomeric unit hence we are calling it as one comma four addition reaction or addition polymerization similarly now carbon number four has become deficient of monomer unit number two so carbon number one of third monomeric unit will attack at this making carbon two deficient because this pi bond is now polarizing so bond between three and fourth will delocalize further so fourth will become deficient so the next node will attack at fourth and that's how the propagation step will take place <coughs> so here the entire representation can be now shown like this look
the double bond has shifted between second and third. So everywhere, and now you will see there will be new bond formation between first carbon of second unit with the fourth carbon of first unit like this so even this first is going to get connected to the fourth carbon of next unit so polymeric chain will go on and on like this from here and this will be connecting to further units so that's how the polymeric chain formation will take place so this is what you see is cis polyisoprene and this is the naturally occurring rubber now guys <coughs> <clears throat> well if you see here this naturally occurring rubber if you talk about its natural existence you'll find that the natural uh, naturally obtained rubber actually can be extracted from many of the plants but you'll see the major resources from where this natural rubber is extracted is from the plant called as plant brasiliensis from where we extract a milky latex uh, a milky kind of substance that we extract from the plant and which we further coagulate that in acetic acid and upon coagulation the substance which is obtained is further processed to obtain the rubber and that rubber contains a polymeric chain of the isoprene unit so we call it as all cis polyisoprene which is the naturally occurring rubber but you'll find that this naturally occurring rubber <coughs> does not have so much of mechanical strength and rigidity Hence, to improve its mechanical strength and other physical property, we subject such kind of rubber to the process called as vulcanization of rubber. So, you may have some question related to vulcanization. You may see a question could be vulcanization brings dash type of linkages in the polymeric chain. So, to answer this question, we need to first understand what is vulcanization. Vulcanization of rubber is the process where we heat the polymeric chains with the sulfurs because of heating polymeric chains with the sulfur it brings a disulfide linkage between the polymeric chain for example if i say i have got polymeric chains like this let's say these are polymeric chains To improve its mechanical strength and other physical property, if I heat it with a sulfur, you will find that will bring a disulfide linkages between the polymeric chain. So, here what you see are disulfide linkages. So, these disulfide linkages, more or less they are acting like a cross linkages which are going to hold this polymeric chains together, which will in improve its mechanical strength. So, vulcanization of rubber is a process of heating the rubber with the sulfur, which brings the disulfide linkages between the polymeric chain that helps to improve the physical properties of rubber. And that's why we carry out vulcanization. So, that was about <coughs> naturally occurring rubber that is called as all cis polyisoprene. Well, let me tell you, there exists one more isomer of the same natural occurring rubber that is trans polyisoprene and that trans polyisoprene is what we call it as gutta percha gutta percha is basically isomer of rubber Yes, guys, so we are discussing about Gutta Parcha. Gutta Parcha is nothing but an isomer of naturally occurring rubber. So, naturally occurring rubber is all cis polyisoprene, whereas Gutta Parcha is a trans polyisoprene. And let me tell you, it is the same polymer which dentists use for the process of root canal. Yes, so this is the polymer that they use. 
Now, like I said, it's an isomer of natural rubber. Natural rubber was cis polyisoprene, and this isomer is found to be a trans polyisoprene. So, trans polyisoprene, you can represent it this way. Look. So, let's say this is a monomeric unit. Just the way I'm representing is different here. <clears throat> Hold on, everyone. I'll keep repeating this. All right. So now see, <coughs> again, 1,4 addition polymerization. So carbon number 1, 2, 3, 4. So if you show the polymerization, if you show the conjugation of double bonds between 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. So pi bond between 1 and 2 is in conjugation between 3 and 4. So this will delocalize here, which will push pi bond at 1, making carbon number 1 electron rich, carbon number 4 electron deficient. So this fourth carbon will be now attacked by... You can represent it this way. So electron rich carbon number one will now attack at deficient carbon number four. And the deficient carbon number four of second unit will be attacked by electron rich carbon number one of third unit. And this bond will shift further, making this carbon deficient. Now, this kind of addition polymerization will result in the formation of There will be new bond formation between second and third. You will see there will be new bond formation between first and the fourth carbon. Similarly here, as well as here, and that will keep on repeating itself. You will see the position of methyl is above and below the pi bond, so we call it as trans polyisoprene, which is the isomer of natural rubber, you call it as gutta parcha. Alright everyone. So yes, when, when it comes to a natural rubber, natural rubber, if question comes as a natural rubber, the first priority you should always consider natural rubber as all cis polyisoprene, but there exists isomer of the natural rubber called as gutta parcha, which is trans polyisoprene. Now there exists the synthetic rubber as well. Synthetic rubbers, we studied three examples of synthetic rubber, which is called as neoprene. Neoprene is polychloroprene. Just like we had polyisoprene, we have got polychloroprene, also called as neoprene. And then two more examples called Buna N and Buna S. Yes, we will see all of those. Let us first talk about synthetic rubber. So guys, like I said, it is important that you remember the name of polymer first. So synthetic rubber is polychloroprene.
as you can see the name chloroprin here indicates just like we had isoprene there was a substitute at carbon number 2 Here we had methyl, we were calling it as isoprene, now instead of methyl, if I take chlorine, we call it as chloroprene. So this is the monomeric unit which will subject it to polymerization. So for the representation, let's say if we have got n number of chloroprene unit, CH2 double bond C carrying chlorine, further CH double bond CH2 subjecting it to process of polymerization and like we studied the polymerization earlier if we take many such unit the pi bond between first and the third carbon will shift between the second and third and the polymerization will eventually give you a product whose representation can be shown like this you'll see the pi bond has now shifted between second and third carbon CH and CH2 n times this is what we call it as neoprene or simply if we say the starting compound or the monomer is chloroprene so the product will be called as polychloroprene polychloroprene Alright, so that was about first synthetic rubber. We studied two more called as Buna N. Buna N is also referred as NBR. NBR stand for N stand for acrylonitrile butadiene rubber. Remember N stand for acrylonitrile. butadiene rubber and the term we call it as bunine for butadiene sodium yes na stand for sodium all the symbolically we represent sodium metal as capital n a but while writing the name of this polymer we use small n only so buna n butadiene sodium acrylonitrile rubber or a polymer so as far as representation is concerned we can show it this way so first monomer we have got is butadiene so let's say we have got n number of CH2 double bond CH CH double bond CH2 so that is butadiene acrylonitrile is nothing but vinyl cyanide and number of that is acrylo nitrile and I'm subjecting this to the process of polymerization okay now for the understanding purpose you can remember it this way Look, we know that there is a conjugation of a pi bond, so naturally there will be delocalization or conjugation will take place, which will make this carbon electron rich, let's say, and the other carbon deficient, just for the understanding purpose, okay? 
Now cyanide, we know that it is electron withdrawing group. So pi bond will delocalize towards carbon since this is withdrawing. So this carbon will become deficient and this is becoming rich. Let's say now this rich has attacked at the deficient and this rich is going to attack at the next deficient carbon of adjacent butadiene, which is carbon number one. So the formation of product can be represented as See, we are assuming it to be undergoing like ionic mechanism. So, for the sake of understanding and to be able to represent the structure of polymer, we are following this kind of process. So, this is the first CH2. See now, the rich carbon of nitrile is going to attack at the first carbon of butyl, meaning this carbon, meaning it is this carbon. So, there is a new bond coming up from the left. Then CH2, single bond CH, double bond CH. So we have got formation of double bond here, single bond CH2, which has now attacked at the adjacent CH2, single bond CH, CN, and this will be repeated n number of times. So you see the product which we have got here is acrylonitrile butadiene rubber that is what you call it as nbr and this reaction will be carried out in presence of sodium metal so you can also call it as butadiene sodium acrylonitrile polymer now instead of this cyanide if i take phenyl ring so it will become phenylethene which you call it as styrene so instead of acrylonitrile, it will become styrene. So butadiene styrene rubber is what you call it as SBR. Just like we have got NBR, the third one called as Buna S, also called as SBR. So SBR stands for styrene. butadiene rubber or like we said earlier buna stands for butadiene sodium styrene polymer so the monomeric unit are again butadiene so let's say we have got n number of butadiene single bond CH, double bond CH2, that's butadiene, treated with styrene, N number of Subjected to polymerization in presence of sodium metal. So you see other monomer that we have got right now here is phenylethene. Phenylethene is known as styrene. And now this is further subjected to process of polymerization. So let's say. A conjugation in butadiene will make one of the carbon electron rich and deficient. Now this rich will attack at the carbon which will break and make other carbon electron rich which is now ready to attack at the first carbon of butadiene and the polymerization will continue. Again this is for the sake of being able to represent the product easily. The first carbon is deficient, CH2, CH double bond, CH, CH2 which has attacked at the first carbon of styrene and the second carbon of styrene is now going to attack at the adjacent unit of butadiene at carbon number 1. 
So the product obtained here is a polymer of styrene and butadiene rubber. So this is what we call it as SBR. All right, everyone. Well, so today in addition polymerization, we saw several examples. We talked about low density polyethylene, high density polyethylene. We talked about uh, Teflon, tetra, polytetrafluoroethylene. We talked about PVC, that is polyvinyl chloride. We also talked about polyacrylonitrile, PAN. And then we saw rubber. We saw naturally, naturally occurring rubber is all cis polyisoprene. There exists isomer of that that is called as uh, trans polyisoprene that is gutta percha. We saw a process of vulcanization of rubber, how it helps to improve the properties of the polymer. And then we saw some synthetic polymer which includes the polychloroprene called as neoprene rubber and also two more example SBR and NBR. So guys, finally what I want as far as the examination point of view is concerned, see most of the question you will see in polymer will be either related to the monomeric unit used for the formation of polymer or directly knowing the structure of polymer. So by they might give you structures of polymer and they'll ask you that name each of this polymer. So it could be a question like a match the column, they'll be give you some names on the left hand side column. To the right, they might give you structure and they'll ask you to match which structure belongs to which particular polymer. Hence, finally, we are practicing the monomers used and their corresponding polymer. So let's say, uh, <clears throat> we have been given some polymers and we have to find out its corresponding. monomeric units unit or units if it's a homopolymer of course there'll be only one type of monomer but if copolymer there are going to be more than one so today what we discuss first is ldp as well as sdp or LDPE and HDPE, you can see. See, like I said, in most of the cases, the name itself will tell you what is going to be monomer. So LDP stand for low density polyethylene. So main monomeric unit is what? Ethylene. Structurally, we represent like this. Number two, we studied was Teflon. So tetrafluoroethylene or polytetrafluoroethylene. So the monomer were tetra fluoro ethene. So we write it as CF2 double bond CF2 <clears throat> third one PVC polyvinyl chloride so what is the monomer here P polyvinyl chloride so vinyl chloride is the monomer vinyl chloride Represented as CH2 double bond CH single bond CL that's vinyl chloride. Fourth is polyacrylonitrile PAN. <clears throat> as you can see, the name suggests acrylonitrile meaning vinyl cyanide. Replace this chlorine with the cyanide and you get acrylonitrile. Acrylonitrile That's the monomer So this was the first four which we saw and then in rubber Natural rubber
In natural rubber, the monomeric unit was isoprene. Of course, it was all cis polyisoprene. So, isoprene is 1,3 butadiene carrying methyl at number 2. So, 2 methyl, 1, 3 butadiene. That's 2 methyl, 1, 3 butadiene. Sixth, we saw Kutta Parcha. So, isomer of natural rubber. So, monomeric unit is still the same. So, again, here we have got isoprene only. Structure will also remain same. Seventh, we saw neoprene. Neoprene is polychloroprene. So, monomeric unit was chloroprene. So, the only change that we'll do is instead of methyl, we'll be in chlorine. So, the monomer is C. And now, we have got chlorine here. CH double bond. CH2. So, 2 chloro. 1,3 butadiene. Eighth, see so far the example which we have seen all are homopolymer because only one type of monomeric unit is subjected to process of polymerization. Now what we are going to study are the copolymer. So the first one we have is NBR, acrylonitrile butadiene rubber. So acrylonitrile butadiene rubber indicates we have got two monomeric unit. One is N stand for acrylonitrile. acrylonitrile and the second one is butadiene so acrylonitrile is what we have got it here where is acrylonitrile yes acrylonitrile that is vinyl cyanide ch2 double bond ch single bond cn and butadiene CH2 double bond CH single bond CH double bond CH2 right everyone and finally the last one which we saw SBR SBR stand for styrene butadiene rubber SBR styrene butadiene rubber so Styrene and butadiene. So instead of cyanide, we'll just take phenyl ring. That is phenyl ethene is what we call it as styrene. So CH2 double bond, CH single bond, pH, and butadiene is what we have used it earlier. One three butadiene. All right, everyone. So, yes, this is important that you guys need to know that in which particular polymer, which monomeric units are used. So far, we have studied only addition polymer. We'll make sure that in the next class, we'll discuss about the condensation polymer. So, guys, let, let's just summarize what we have studied today. We started a new chapter called as polymer. We saw all the basic term, what is called polymer, what is monomer, and the term polymerization. We saw we can classify polymers in several ways. Number one, classification on the basis of sources so natural synthetic semi-synthetic are the further types of this classification second classification was on the basis of structure of polymeric chain so we studied linear polymer branch chain polymer and crosslink or network polymer third one was the important that was classification on the basis of intermolecular forces so we saw there exists elastomers fibers thermoplastic and thermo setting polymers then we saw classification on the basis of mode of polymerization reaction so we studied addition polymerization and the condensation polymerization 
Then there were two more types of classification, not really that important, but still we studied number one based on the monomeric unit, homopolymer and copolymer. Like the first seven example here are type of homopolymer because they are using only one type of monomeric unit. But the next two, eighth and ninth, are copolymer because they are using more than one type of monomeric unit. Then the last classification was biodegradable and non-biodegradable polymers. And then guys, straight away we first studied the <coughs> free radical addition polymerization reaction so we took example of benzoyl peroxide which produced benzyl free radical as an initiator which attacked at ethene to form a radical which further propagated the reaction and then we saw the step of termination as well then we studied some important addition polymer which includes all these which are right on your screen you need to know the names of polymer and their corresponding monomers used so guys that is it from our today's class of polymer i'll see you soon in the next class to learn the condensation polymers so we'll stop here thank you so much for attending the class happy learning to you all everyone thank you so much